Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Whew. It's that time. Napoleon time, my favorite time. You know the deal. Original link down at the top of the description below. All right. It, I hope you're ready to learn. If you're not, you don't even deserve to watch this great of a video. Great of a series within a series within the greatest channel. On YouTube, in my opinion, Epic History TV. Uh, you guys have been great. Show us how good you guys are at recommending. If you're not subscribed. My name's Connor. Hello. Uh, love for you to join. Learn history through YouTube recommendations, which uh, we're awesome at. You guys are great at. Love to have you. The more the merrier. Uh, let's... <clears throat> excuse me. Let's get right into it. Original link to the video at the top of the description below. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Alright. Get in the time machine again. We're not just viewers. We are... Actors. No. Uh, we are participants. There you go. There's the word. Alright. Great channel. Let's go. Mura and uh, the guy with a really hard to pronounce name are my two favorites so far, but hey. Terror Belly Decus Pacis. Oh, this channel. So Terror great. in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. Damn right. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. Again, whoever originally recommended this channel, I owe authority. you big time. Authority symbolized <clears throat> by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian... People got really mad at me for not knowing why it was so important to burn the, the uh, standards and... The thing, I get it. All right, I get it, guys. You're right. I was wrong. Spirit of the age, but in 1804, no, you're great. Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26. Yes, it is, and you better be ready. Our own evaluation of their <clears> achievements <throat> as marshals, with expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Pot former chief historian of the French army. Oh, shout out so to that historian. Far, so good. Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Just fixing my coffee Rouchy, over here. Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Lefebvre Mortier, him Marmont, and Murat. Saint-Cyr, Oudinot, Victor, and Murat. Who could be a more fitting video sponsor than NapoleonSouvenirs.com? Hey, I don't online usually shop for fans of the Napoleon. We're gonna era. go through this. Since we're 2010, let it play. the team at NapoleonSouvenirs.com has offered the finest quality gifts and souvenirs for those who adore this dramatic period of history. No aspect of the Napoleonic era has been forgotten. With busts and statuettes of the Emperor gonna himself, sit through the uh, Napoleon themed champagne, and stunning replicas of Napoleonic swords and pistols, as well as uniforms and flags of the Grand Armée and Imperial Guard, and even the baton of a Maréchal. You can visit their cool. online store really cool. at napoleonsouvenirs.com, <clears throat> or if you're lucky enough to be in Paris, visit the Boutique Napoleon in person. Vive l'Empereur! And thank you to NapoleonSouvenirs.com for sponsoring out. this video. Nine. Marshall. So is the makeup... Did I ask this in another video? I might have. Is the makeup... It seems like there's like makeup, maybe lipstick and stuff. Is it, Was that just something of the... Of the time that like higher up... Uh, higher up class people would do that was fashionable um but yeah it seems to be maybe the, the painting is just like Bessier. that yeah i praise jean baptiste bessier was the son of a surgeon with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern france when the french revolution began he volunteered for the National Guard Whoa, those and was eyebrows. sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard, 
along with his old school friend, Georges-Anne Murat. This unit was soon disbanded, but Bessières remained in Paris and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August, 1792. In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, so he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, Are there his some good sized mountains Mura in the Pyrenees. Noticed by the army commander, or is it like General kind of Bonaparte, minor mountain range? Who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessier distinguished himself as a cavalry. I need to shot. shut up. I missed His that. friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough Always to good. make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessier distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon... Look at everyone, like, obviously that's the main kind of place they're attacking and all of the people fleeing. All the boats are going away, not towards. ...at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessier with command of the elite Consular Guard Cavalry, which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. That's in 1804, Bessier became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. Bessier himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative, who liked to powder his hair in the old style. That's his how great this wife, channel is. It Jeanne, answers my questions court, right away. Doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. In 1805, Bessier commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role. I wonder, I wonder which is more annoying to people. If, And I'm pausing right now. If I say something that's on my mind while the video is going or when I pause it. I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, <laughs> so. Repelling the Russian guard at the battle's climax. At Eilau in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessières' opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back. Yeah, seeing Friedland, like, I've never had a, a feeling like this uh, on a series. Maybe it's because I've been watching it with you guys. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I've been watching it step by step. But just looking back at this, it's almost like looking back just on like the the start of this journey like looking back on like a semester it's like oh my god remember Friedland how how many videos ago that was uh yeah it's been a great experience again subscribe please as his last reserve as at Friedland in 1808 Bessie oh, received that. his first major independent command in northern Spain that May the country erupted in revolt against the French Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco, winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessières was given command of the reserve cavalry a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessier and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Aspern on his left. This is where they sent those uh, barges, just filled up boats with uh, stones or something to make them heavy and float them downstream to destroy the hastily made, um, you know, the French engineers making the uh, bridges quickly. They could destroy those. Later on, they make more sturdy bridges, the French. Left and Lan holding Essling on the right. 
when the Smart Austrian tactic. commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack. Bessières, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges, helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. Bessières and his cavalry performed bravely. Um, what is that he's holding? Is that... Can't be a sword. Is that like a, a horse kind of whip? What is that? But that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lann nearly came to blows when Lann accused Bessières of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lann was fatally wounded the next day. Bessières has Lann... Is that Bessier right there? Anne was fatally wounded the next day. Bessier commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessier's horse and injured his leg. A rumor reached the Imperial Guard that Bessier was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander, until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessières. It reduced my guard to tears. What a poet. As a devout Catholic, Bessières <clears throat> was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine, leading to a short spell out of favor. In 1811, leading it, to a short spell out Ney? of favor. Marshal Ney. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found an impossible situation, a widespread insurgency and insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessières ordered his share of executions and reprisals in his attempt to pacify northern Spain. Brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to win all the glory. Wow. In 1812, Bessières accompanied Napoleon into Russia, commanding his guard cavalry. Since the guard was kept in reserve... He likes me more, no. He saw little action Marshall. until the retreat, when he led the advance guard, clearing a path for the survivors. The disaster in Russia left Bessières severely demoralized, but he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander in Marshal Murat's absence. On the 1st of May, 1813, Bessières was scouting enemy positions. I want to hear a story. I want to hear, see some episodes about the horses, like some of the main horses. All right, I want to hear their story. Positions ...before the Battle of Lützen, when a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander. How big is a cannonball, like? Like... I'm sure they, they range in caliber or size or whatever, but. Like, they, I feel like this is, that'd be a big cannonball, I feel like. But, I mean, if it hit you in the chest, how, how, how are you not severed? And one of his last remaining friends. Yeah. It is surely a great loss for you and your children. Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. Wow. No kids allowed to watch that one. I'm not true. Of a dependable killing him instantly. When a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander and one of his last remaining friends. 
It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. I didn't get to fully kind of appreciate that moment. That's why I rewinded it or rewatched it. Marshall McDonald. Jacques McDonald's father was a Scotsman who'd supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat at Culloden, the family fled to France. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, Macdonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish émigrés. In the Revolutionary Wars, he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent and brave officer, and served as aide-de-camp to General de Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemap, paving the way for rapid promotion from lieutenant to general in just two years. He led his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. In 1798, he was sent to Rome as governor and later commanded the army of Naples. Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's Army of Italy, he was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry, and while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the Trebia by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. But Macdonald's own conduct Fail. won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland. I'm going to watch the episodes about that, that, that I missed. led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's, but was never immortalized in quite the same way. In 1804, Macdonald's former commander, General Moreau, was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. Macdonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man, but disastrous. He almost looks like a woman right there. For his career. Moreau was exiled. Macdonald was placed under police surveillance and retired to his country estate in disgrace. Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor. I would have been a great marshal. I would have been Napoleon's favorite, for sure. Yeah. Those who agree, let me know in the comments. <laughs> to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. Macdonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was Macdonald's. By the way, anyone who says no to me, by the Emperor, being a marshal, you're dead. With the main attack on the enemy center, he formed his troops into a giant open backed square and advanced into a hail of fire. Napoleon, watching through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! Wow. Macdonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. That the next really day, put Napoleon in, uh, went to find him on the, battlefield on the battlefield and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. In addition, Macdonald received the title Duke of Taranto and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty... Okay, hey, so all three of those guys have been mentioned, right? ...remained to France, not to Napoleon. 
MacDonald spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, Suchet? commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. I think it's hard this to put yourself... It's such a dumb statement, it's obvious, in the shoes of someone... Uh, defending like <clears throat> it's obviously going to be so it's hard to imagine someone invading your own country and fighting for your own homeland i'd imagined everyone would be much more um willing to put their life on the line that doesn't take away from the courage Corps, composed of german troops and reluctant prussian allies guarded the left flank of the invasion and had a relatively quiet campaign in December, the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians, leaving the loyal remnants of MacDonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. By 1813, Napoleon relied on MacDonald as one of his senior marshals. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when MacDonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and MacDonald's army was routed. Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. MacDonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck were also to blame. Napoleon certainly continued to respect MacDonald's military judgment. He continued to command 11th Corps and was in the thick of the fighting at Leipzig two months later. MacDonald was with the rear guard when the French retreat began and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. This is a major point where, McDonald of many times, where I'm sure there's good reason. Obviously, there's forest here, and it's it's kind of hard. Maybe this isn't the scenario. It happened somewhere else, but I feel like it was a constant theme of, and and there's less of an excuse of hindsight the more times it happens of Napoleon having his his escape route, and just no one no one being able to cut it off. I thought happened With quite a bit. With the rear guard when the French retreat began and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. When the Elster Bridge was blown too early, he himself was trapped on the wrong side of the river and just managed to swim to safety under enemy fire. Okay. MacDonald continued to serve Napoleon as a loyal and reliable commander throughout the 1814 campaign, effectively serving as his deputy at several key moments. Unlike most marshals, MacDonald was never under Napoleon's spell and always spoke his mind to the Emperor. This in itself was a valuable service, though it sometimes led to heated arguments. Good to have someone Perhaps like that. inevitably, in April, it was MacDonald. Doesn't he kind of look like Tom Cruise right there? Is that just me? Donald and Ney, who took the lead in confront... Is that Mura? There's Ney. Is that McDonald right there? Is that him? No, that's McDonald right there. You can tell from his nose. Napoleon with the facts of his situation. The war was lost, and he must abdicate. Napoleon named MacDonald as one of the three men who would negotiate with the Allies, telling his you guys better minister, be proud of me. De How much I've learned. MacDonald does not like me, but he is a man of his word, of high principles, and he can be relied on. In their last meeting, Might be the a few best days later, yet. Napoleon told MacDonald, I did not know you well. I was prejudiced against you. I have done so much for so many others who have abandoned me. And you, who owe me nothing, have remained faithful. I appreciate your loyalty. Too late. Wow. Statements MacDonald like that have given me so much more respect for Napoleon. Kept on as a military advisor by France's restored Bourbon monarchy. He continued to speak his mind. So much so that Louis XVIII nicknamed him his outspokenness. During the Hundred Days, MacDonald remained loyal to the king and attempted to rally what troops to, to fight against What happened to Louis XVII? 
Did that happen? Because Louis the Sixteenth was the one who got decapitated, right? And that was Louis the Eighteenth. Maybe I missed something. When he saw this was futile, he escorted the king to safety in Belgium, then returned to Paris, where he refused to meet with Napoleon. After the defeat at Waterloo, he was put in charge of demobilizing the last elements of Napoleon's Grande Armée, and helped many officers to escape arrest by the Bourbons. MacDonald was a methodical, reliable, if unspectacular commander. But he distinguished himself, above all, by his lack of vanity or personal ambition, his complete loyalty to France, and his willingness to speak his mind. Virtues that were all too rare among Napoleon's marshals. I've never heard the word spoken of uh, lack of ambition. I've never kind of, this is the first time I've ever kind of seen that as a good quality, and obviously this video does too. Add. All right, Dom. He's really Snacks. good, though. One of my favorite uh, marshals so far. We're gonna have to stop them. Non-skippable ad. Oh yeah, you you drive cars again for the ninth time. We get it. Seven. Marshal Massena. He looks kind of like one of my old neighbors, or my you know the dad one of my. Old... He came alive when surrounded by danger. When defeated, he was always ready to begin again, as if he was in fact the victor. Good quality in a soldier. André Massena was born in Nice, at that time not technically part of France, but of the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. His father, a shopkeeper, died when he was young, so he ran away to sea, then at 17 enlisted in the French army. He was quickly made a sergeant. Imagine running away, how, how young was he? Shopkeeper died when he was young, so he ran away to sea. At age 13 and then what age? At 17. Imagine how he changed in those four years. Just how I feel like, obviously, it's not true for everyone, but uh, in the developed world, I guess that kind of um, not lifestyle, life path kind of seems horrible at first. But just imagine the the experience and the change and the development and growth and character of that kid from. 13 to 17, like running away, joining the Navy, Navy at 13, and then coming back afterwards. Uh, just how he would have grown, that would be a great story to um, see. He enlisted in the French Army. He was quickly made a sergeant, but a commoner could rise no higher in the Royal Army. So after 14 years' service, he quit. Really? When the French Revolution began, he oh, duh, yeah. re-enlisted in a local volunteer battalion. Massena, supremely self-confident and unfazed by any challenge, was elected to command the battalion and led it with success against the Austrians on the Piedmontese front. Despite his lack of education, he proved an instinctive combat leader. He was soon promoted to brigadier, and after leading a successful attack at the Siege of Toulon, was made General of Division. He won an impressive victory over the Austrians at Loano in 1795, and when the Army of Italy's commander, General Scherer, resigned over lack of support from the government in Paris, many expected Massena to replace him. Instead, the job went to the 26-year-old General Bonaparte, 11 years younger and much less experienced than Massena, but with far better political connections. Nevertheless, Napoleon and Massena worked together brilliantly. Massena commanded his advance guard and played a major role in several of his early victories. In reports, Napoleon described Massena as active, tireless, audacious. He won so many battles that Napoleon acclaimed him l'enfant gâté de la victoire, the spoiled child of victory. Massena was, however, notorious for extorting vast sums from the local Italians, often while his own troops went hungry and... Natural causes at 58, what? ...without pay. In 1798, Massena received his first independent command, the Army of Switzerland. 
The next spring, after French defeats on the Rhine and in Italy, responsibility for the defence of France lay in his hands. Rather than wait to be encircled, he attacked and won a brilliant victory over Austrian and Russian forces at the Battle of Zurich. In very mountainous terrain. Rewarded with command of the Army of Italy, Massena led a heroic defence of Genoa in 1800. He was eventually starved into surrender, but his stubborn defence bought Napoleon enough time to cross the Alps and defeat the Austrians at Marengo. Physically exhausted by this last ordeal and surrounded by accusations of corruption, Massena was recalled to Paris and went into semi-retirement. When he was made a marshal by Napoleon in 1804, he seemed distinctly underwhelmed, and on being congratulated, remarked, there are 14 of us. But Massena was one of the few marshals who'd proved themselves in independent command, making him a priceless asset to Napoleon. In 1805, he was recalled to active service and given command of the Army of Italy in the war against the Third Coalition. Massena kept Archduke Charles's army busy in Italy, while the Emperor won his great victories at Ulm and Austerlitz. In 1806, Massena oversaw the occupation of the Kingdom of Naples, ordering brutal reprisals against local resistance. In 1807, he commanded V Corps in Poland, but his role covering Warsaw meant he missed the major battles of Eylau and Friedland. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, Whoa, look he was at accidentally that. shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notorious... Oh my god, that's brutal. So they shoot the deer and then have the dogs go after it? A lot of dogs. They're just like watching right there. How did they even get the... Shot in hunting with the Check out that house, though. Oh, my God. You can't even see the ends of it. How many? Like 50 chimneys? The Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau. He was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. He lost the use of his entourage at Fontainebleau. He was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. Who oh, shot me in the face? Uh, Napoleon. Oh! Oh, good shot, sir. Oh, it was my fault, actually. Uh, by the way, about the houses, um, uh, they're marked as, like, chateau. As, uh, I noticed that a lot, especially driving through France uh, from Switzerland. Uh, through France, there are, and some in Germany, too. They're just... One thing you don't really have in America, which uh, in some places like Newport, but just every now and then in these huge fields of like kind of normal houses, every now and then there's just this huge, beautiful mansion um, that just like pops up. It's just, it's crazy. Shot in the face and Nothing lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier claimed responsibility. The war against Austria in 1809 saw Massena back near his best. His corps formed the vanguard for the crossing of the Danube and fought ferociously to hold the village of Aspern against an overwhelming Austrian onslaught. Massena was everywhere, displaying his usual coolness under fire and, when ordered to retreat, ensured his troops pulled back across the river in good order. The battle was a defeat, but Massena had been superb. Together, he and the Emperor oversaw preparations for the next attempt to cross the Danube six weeks later. Ooh, the Ost like attempt. That. I wish my room was just covered in, in, th in these 
painting Just pictures. across the Danube six weeks later. The Austrians were waiting for them at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. Well, didn't he didn't show up in time. Target for Austrian gunners. Well, wow, that's great. From a carriage, riding accident a few days at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. He made a fine target for Austrian gunners, but was still able to organize a complex redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle, covered by Marshal Bessier's cavalry charge. Massena's bold maneuver secured the French left flank. I love how the cavalry charge is almost used like a missile. Target for Austrian gunners. It's like you, you know, here. It's like all right. There's an opening. Send it. But was still able to organize right. a complex redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle, covered right by Marshal Bessier's cavalry shoot charge. Massena's bold maneuver secured the French left flank and won further praise from Napoleon. Massena, already ennobled as the Duke of Rivoli, received a new title, but a flesh Prince wound. of Essling, and another less welcome reward command of French forces for the invasion of Portugal. Massena was deeply reluctant to go and complained bitterly about his appointment. He was showing clear signs of exhaustion and was plagued by rheumatism and bad lungs. When he arrived in Spain, General Foy observed, he's only 52, but is he rheumatism, more... is that like arthritis? Okay, yeah. One second, guys. Oh. He might call back. All right. Okay. In Spain, General Foy observed, he's only 52, but he looks more than 60. He's lost weight and has begun to stoop. His glance since the accident in which he lost an eye has lost its keenness. His subordinates, already underwhelmed by his appearance, were outraged that the marshal also decided to bring along his mistress, poorly disguised as an officer of dragoons. Mulan? The French invasion of Portugal proved a disaster. That was Mulan? Undone by Wellington's scorched earth tactics, a hostile population and terrain, and Massena's own lethargic leadership. His It just really seemed like he's like, fine, I'll go to Spain, but he's just like, all right, fine, I'm going, but I'm not going to care. Like, yeah, like, I'll bring my mistress, not even try to, it's like, who's that uh, woman? And, oh, that's, that, that's, a, that's not a woman, that's just a, a soldier right there. And then just be like, yeah, just go over there. Call commanders, especially Marshal Ney, were scathing of his conduct. At Busaco, Massena squandered lives with an unnecessary frontal attack on a strong British position. Okay, now not cool. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications, the impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Massena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements. So, was it Massena who got shot in the eye? Accidentally shot in the face. The Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in Bailau and Friedland. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame, but the loyal Marshal Berthier. Okay, well, now I'm, I'm torn here, all right? I was... Uh... 52. He's like, you shot me in the face, all right? Yeah, I'll go to Spain for you, sure. Hey, mistress, get over here. Dress up like a soldier. Yeah, just just go straight in. Uh, sir, what, what should we do, sir? I mean, at, at that point, though, you're just, you're not just messing with Napoleon if you're still mad about losing the eye, which I don't blame you. Now you're costing people's lives, your own soldiers, who didn't have anything to do with that, so... 
I understand I'd be pissed too, but that's not okay. Necessary frontal attack on a strong British position. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications, the impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Massena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements that never came, while sickness and guerrilla raids took their toll on his army. Five months later, he recrossed the mountains back into Spain, leaving a string of devastated villages behind him. The next summer, at Fuentes de Oñoro, Massena attacked Wellington's army once more, and despite much hard fighting, again failed to win a clear victory. He bl I thought, it, I've seen this painting, this picture, photo, whatever you want to call it, a few times now, and um, I've never really put, um, each time I look at it, I'm like, wait a second, why is a British guy slicing the throat of another British guy uh, with his bayonet? But it, it obviously, he just, this guy running by on the horse, French cavalryman, um, sit with the saber, slice his neck, and he like went like that. And so it just looks like that. Blamed Marshal Bessier for his lack of support. But the Emperor's patience was at an end. He sent Marshal Marmont to replace... Oh, your, your patience is at, is at an end? Can I shoot you in the, in the face? The Senna. And when they next met, greeted him with the cutting words, So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer Masena. Yeah, thanks Masena's for the eye. health was now in steep decline. He never held a major command again, though he was... Re died of natural causes. Died of... Died age 58 in Paris. Died of low morale from being shot in the face by Napoleon. Called in 1813 to supervise a military district in southern France. He died after a long illness in 1817. In his prime, Massena was a superb commander, incisive and dangerous. Until he got shot but in the he face. was past his best by the time he became a marshal. Nevertheless, there were enough sparks of his old brilliance to worry his adversaries. The Duke of Wellington once remarked, When Massena was opposed to me in the field, I never slept comfortably. Bessier, MacDonald, Massena. Twenty down, six to go. Join us for the next part. So there the are two more parts. All right, so there's a five and a six. You guys did tell me that in the comments, a few in a few comment sections in my videos. Williams Marshals, as we reveal our Just top let's six it up. coming soon. Yeah, so these were great. Musain at the end. I mean, the eye. These are really three great ones. I'm gonna say Musain is out of it, just because how how he was at the end. Um, these two are really good. Bessier, Bessier, Bessier. Probably him. But, uh, yeah, Mura is probably my favorite, number one. Number two between these two. Thank you to Napoleon. Thank you. Alrighty. I think I'm gonna, going to do another one. That, that was so awesome. I, I think I might just do part five after this. Uh, so keep an eye out. See you guys later.